Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning to us in person and a special hello to those watching online. And I have to share something with you all this morning. Um, I feel like I can trust you all. Over these past 20 minutes, I feel like we've really bonded and I feel like I can really trust you all. Um, can, can, can you all trust the secret I'm about to tell you and not tell anyone? And those watching online, well, don't tell anyone that's already not watching online. Um, here it is. I have to admit that one of my guilty pleasures, one of my things I've done spending time, uh, you know, passing time through the pandemic is watching home renovation shows. Um, anyone else love a good home renovation shows? Yeah, I know, I know Pastor George. Um, I, think, I think he's in contract with HGTV to have his own show, but that's, that's another thing. Um, so I love home renovation shows. There's something about watching a room get this extreme makeover, or there's something about the entire house getting this huge renovation that I just love. And it hit me the other day. I think I know why I love it so much. It gives me the chance to live out my dreams through the TV, right? So I am, as much as I love home improvement and DIY shows, I am the worst at those projects. Um, you can imagine how crazy this drives my wife who loves DIY and home improvement stuff. In fact, let, let me let you into our little, um, our little world at home right now. We embarked on a couple, pro, you know, a, a marriage together project of peeling off our wallpaper and painting... <laughs> Yeah, I should have talked to you all first. And, and, and peeling off our, wall, our, our wallpaper and painting our living room. Now those, my married or dating folks in here, you know how much stress a marriage or relationship gets by peeling wallpaper and choosing paint colors together. Um, this is not going well. I'm much more of a pay someone to do it than to do it myself kind of guy. Um, so that's the welcome to our world. It is a nightmare. But I love, there's something just exciting about something being renewed or restored. There's something exciting. There's an energy about this renovation work that gets done to tear down the old and bring up the new. But we know sitting here today, I'm watching online, we know that renovation isn't just done in homes. It's also done in our hearts as well. It's done in, in our inner world. And today I want us to talk a little bit about inner renovation that's done in our own lives, in our own hearts, in our own minds um, by by. God himself. So we've been in the series called Welcome Home, and we've been talking about the season of Advent is the celebration of Jesus making his home in our world, of coming, moving into the neighborhood, if you will. And we've been talking about different views of what home is according to the Bible. And today we're going to talk a little bit about our inner home, or if you will, and this inner renovation work that gets done. Now here's the definition of internal renovation for the purposes of today. It's any shift that happens in your heart or mind that is shaped or influenced by a greater power. Now this internal shift, it leads to a change that happens in our behavior. So an internal change that leads to an external result. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. And it's by a, a power or greater influence than ourselves. So let me give you some examples. It can be an ideal, an ideal or a value that, that you really are hanging on to, that you want to try to implement in your life. Um, or maybe it's this, it's this deep conviction that you have about a struggle or an addiction that you, that you really want to try to figure out the solution for. Uh, maybe, maybe it's even something like insight on a new idea or a new perspective that you believe. And there's this internal renovation that occurs to tear down the old and build up the new. That's what an internal renovation looks like. And just like peeling wallpaper and picking paint colors, it's not easy. It's not easy. Let me let you in for a little bit on my own struggle with internal renovation. Uh, see, some of you that know me, you know this, but I am cursed slash blessed to have this inner critic that constantly speaks to me. And this inner critic, sometimes it's silly, like, oh, you said your drive through order wrong. What's wrong with you? But, but other times it's a little more serious. So other times my inner, inner critic will say, you are nothing. You're worthless. Nobody really likes you. They're pretending. See, that my inner critic, when not kept healthily in check, it just runs wild. And for those of you that are into the Enneagram, I'm, I'm a number one, the perfectionist, infamously known on the Enneagram. And this inner critic, it runs wild. And if not kept healthy in check, things get bad. See, sometimes I can withdraw from my family and my friends and my loved ones because I just feel so defeated or overwhelmed. And this is still a struggle for me. It's a daily struggle of, of learning to love my inner critic. But here's the deal. I love my inner critic more than I did yesterday because of God's work in my life. And what happens is slowly but surely, this internal renovation has been happening in me 
to begin to not be trapped by my inner critic, but learning to love and live with my inner critic. See, this internal renovation, it's hard work, and, but it's difficult and necessary. Now, we can spend the rest of our time together today uh, talking about what those renovations are that occur in our life. And these are important, what the renovations are. We're going to mention those a little bit later. But I want the focus of today to be something a little bit bigger, because if we talk about the what and miss the who, we've missed everything. So I want to ask this question today for you to think about. It'll be on the screen. It's in your message notes. Who can renovate my life? Who can renovate my life? That's the question we're going to be focusing on for our time together today. And I want to talk to two different groups of people for just a moment. Um, the first group I want to talk to, you walked into this place, or you're watching online, and, and you, you genuinely are asking this question. Who can renovate my life? This has been a really difficult year for, for a lot of us, and, and chances are that you've lost something. You might have lost a family member or a loved one. You might have lost your job. You might have lost your money. You might have lost a relationship. You might have lost a friendship. You might have lost your patience. You might have lost your sobriety. You might have lost your sanity. <laughs> and I know this has been difficult. And you might be looking around today wondering who is going to fix this broken world? Who's going to fix my broken life? And here's what I want to say. If that's you and you're here today or you're watching online, here's what I want to say to you. I want to say that we at Grace Church, we know you and we see you in your struggle. And we love you too. And, and here's why I can say that with such confidence. Because God does the exact same thing. That God sees you and he knows you and he loves you too. And I just want to take a moment. It wouldn't be right if we just swept past this. I want to take a moment because maybe for the first time today, you're ready to, to answer that question, who can renovate my life? You're ready to put Jesus as the answer to that question. Where you're on your last resort and you came here and you watched online not knowing where else to turn. And I want to invite you to take a moment. We're going to do this together. I want to, I want to let those who need to have that moment to say yes to do so. And you don't have to have everything figured out. You don't have to have it all, all, all the solutions. You can just come and say yes as you are. And God will meet you there. So let's bow our heads, close our eyes. And I'm just going to say this simple prayer. If you've never said yes to asking God to be the Savior, the ultimate renovator of your life, I want to invite you to do that now. Just repeat after me in your head. Just say, God, I welcome you to be the renovator of my life. God, I've been searching and looking in all the wrong places. And God, I need you. God, I turn the will and control of my life over to you. With as much as I understand, I put my faith in you. God, help me and be my renovator. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So can we just take a moment? Can we celebrate? For anyone that did that just now here in person or online, can we take a moment and celebrate that? Because that's a huge deal. That's awesome. Yeah. And I want to give you a couple of next steps if that was you. I want to give you a couple of next steps. The first thing is, is I want you to either, if you're in person, visit our next steps table in the lobby as soon as service is over. We'd love to help you and give you some more info on, on, on what this looks like moving forward. And if you're online, um, message your chat host. You can, you can tell them right now. You can put it in the public chat or you can private message them. Let them know that you said yes because we'd love to celebrate with you and give you some help. Another thing I want to invite you to um, is, is our blue Christmas service happening tonight. Um, as of right now, I believe we have a few spots still available. Very few. I'm getting, I'm getting the live update. Very few spots available um, to, to meet in person. So if you want to come to Blue Christmas, this is a special service about um, healing and those, and those walking through grief and loss, and we've all lost something this year. So we'd love for you to join us tonight at 6 in the sanctuary for Blue Christmas. You can also watch online if you're, if you're not, not here in town, if you're not able to register. Um, we ha we'll have it available online. But we want to encourage you to engage in that as well. So that's one group of people I want to talk to. Now I want to talk to another group of people right now. And, and these are the group of people that maybe you've been going around church for a while. Maybe you have a relationship with Jesus. And maybe when I put that question on the screen of who can renovate my life, you treated it like the classic, Sunday, like the classic statement of the answer to every question in Sunday school is Jesus. And, and you knew the answer and you're like, check, I'm doing great today <laughs> at church. But here's what I want to encourage you to do. In these next few moments, I want to encourage you to, to lean in and be honest with yourself and answer this. Even though you know with your head, and I know with my head, that Jesus 
is the renovator of my life or, or can renovate my life, do we really live it out? Do we really live out Jesus being the ultimate renovator in all these areas of our lives? Or are we what well, a term I heard this week called practical atheists? Where we know that we know God's power, we don't question that. But when it comes to allowing him in and allowing him to transform the areas of our life that need transforming, well, we don't necessarily do that as much. Is Jesus the actual renovator of my life? Here's some examples to make this a little more practical for you. Do you allow culture to dictate your friendships, your relationships, your marriage, and how to act in that? Or do you look to God to be the one to guide you in your relationships? Do you turn to Visa or MasterCard on how to handle your finances, especially around this time of the year? Or do you let God guide you on how to wisely use your resources? Do you let your political opinion be informed by CNN, Fox News, and Newsmax, or do you listen to what God might have to say about some of those things? And hear me, I'm not up here to throw stones because quite honestly, those three things are the three top three in my life where I struggle. There are many times where I let other influences dictate uh, my opinion and, and how I act around certain things. And that's embarrassing for the pastor to admit that he's sometimes a practical atheist, but it's real. And I'm sure I'm not alone. I'm sure we can all relate to this. And the reality is this, is we have choices how we answer that question, who can renovate my life? We have choices. And I want us to look at the Christmas story today because believe it or not, the Christmas story is actually a story about choices too. So we're going to look at this from Luke chapter 2. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. Now, this is the traditional story of Christmas, right? And if you've, whether you've been around church for a while or haven't been around church, chances are you've heard this story told before. But my guess is you're more familiar with the second half of this story, right? Of, of the baby being born and wrapped in the cloths and placed in a manger. And for today, I want us to focus on the other half of this story. And here's why. You might have heard us say this around here, that context is everything when it comes to reading the Bible. See, context, it provides the, a richer view and it provides the backstory, the bigger picture of what the actual narrative of what's happening is. Think of it like this. And when you know that the Grinch's heart is two sizes too small, you begin to know that, oh, he's not just some grumpy dude who hates Christmas. Like, no, there's a reason, there's a reason for that. That's what, that's what context does. It gives us the backstory. It gives us the narrative. It gives us the bigger picture of what the narrative actually is. So for today, I want us to focus on the first five words of what we just read. In those days, Caesar Augustus. In those days, Caesar Augustus. Now, oftentimes, authors, uh, when, they would write the, when they would write their books of the Bible, they would l sort of use rulers and who was ruling at that time as, a, as a, like, a, like a time stamp. It would help, us, it help be able to verify historically when it happened, and it would give us some idea of what year this occurred. But this term, in those days, Caesar Augustus, those words, they're more than a time stamp for us in this case. They're more like a landmark. And here's what I mean. Uh, we need to take into account who Caesar Augustus was and why it was so important that Luke mentioned him right away. See, Caesar Augustus, as you might remember from history class, was this emperor of Rome, this ruler who built Rome into a great empire. And, and he was beloved by many. Uh, he was a self-proclaimed peacemaker and he brought peace to, to lots of people. But it was beyond just the deal that he was a great ruler. See, people, they thought that, but they thought even more that he was a savior, that he was divine, that he was literally a God among men and women. Uh, you can read, there's authors and poets and, and people who would write about um, Augustus' divine-like figure, about how he was in their minds their savior. Uh, Pastor Wes actually showed me this really cool thing this week. In fact, you might not know this. See, Pastor Wes is our resident history scholar here on staff. Um, he reads plaques just for fun. It's crazy. Um, now, if you need, let me say this, if you need sports facts 
or good Netflix show suggestions, I'm your guy, okay? Um, if you need useful information about history and real things, Pastor Wes is your guy, okay? So just so we have that clear. So Pastor Wes showed me this really awesome thing this week, that in 9 BC, there, there was a fragment that was discovered from 9 BC, and written on it was people praising how blessed they are that they have a savior or messiah of Caesar Augustus. And keep this in mind, 9 BC was before Jesus, Jesus was here on earth. So in their minds, in many people's minds, Caesar Augustus was their Lord, was their king. There was already an established kingdom on earth. That's what Luke is getting at. But Luke's also getting at something else. He's saying there might be an established kingdom already made, but there's another king coming. There's another king coming. And he might not look like Caesar, and he might not act like Augustus, but there is another king coming that's going to bring a kingdom that is bigger than Rome's ever seen, and bigger than what you can imagine. See, Luke is getting at there's this idea of a choice. A choice between Caesar Augustus and a choice between Jesus. A choice between an earthly king and a choice between a heavenly king. A choice between a self-proclaimed peacemaker and a choice between the prince of peace. A choice between a king and the choice between the king of kings. There was a choice. And N.T. Wright, who's a New Testament scholar, says this, describes this, this moment like this. The birth of this little boy is the beginning of a confrontation between the kingdom of God and all its apparent weakness, insignificance, and vulnerability and the kingdoms of this world. Now, if we get honest with ourselves, though, just like there was a choice between kings a few thousand years ago, there's a choice between kings now in our life, isn't there? And I'm not just talking political here. Hear me. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going there. I'm talking bigger than that. I'm talking about we have a choice between what the greatest influence in our life is. Is it something earthly like Caesar or is it something heavenly like Jesus? And if we get really honest with ourselves, we'd admit that we find ourselves far too often looking for our own Caesars to be the greatest influence of our life, don't we? Because honestly, it sometimes just looks better. The, what, 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 would, what the earth would deem looking better or look most appealing sometimes isn't what God would deem looking most appealing. Like, think about this. Think about the Christmas story. Caesar Augustus, he's got the power, he's got the wealth, he's got the influence, he's got the reputation, he's got the backing of the entire world. That's a king that the world would follow, not a baby in a manger with two ordinary parents. On the outside, it doesn't look, it doesn't look like it's even a close matchup. It doesn't even look close. In fact, Caesar, Augustus, and Jesus couldn't be more opposite. See, Jesus, he entered the world in an ordinary way, in a manger. Uh, Caesar Augustus was born into royalty and lived near the palace. Jesus, he lived in the common town of Nazareth. These were two opposite, two totally different kings, but one king would be the king of kings. And it looked totally different than what the world had expected. But why is that? I think I know the answer. Because Jesus is a different kind of king. Jesus is an upside down king. There's this new fad going around, I don't know, or a revitalized fad, I should say. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's the upside down Christmas tree. Have you heard of this? Have you seen this? Now, those of us with cats and small children are used to the knock down Christmas tree. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the upside down Christmas tree. And it's this new fad where it flips what we know and literally flips it upside down. And it seems weird and it seems not right and it seems different, but yet it's pretty incredible, if we're being honest. God works in the same way. See, Jesus is an upside down kind of king. And he flipped the idea of greatness, the world's idea of greatness on its head, even when he came into this world. And this idea of Jesus flipping the idea of great, world's idea of greatness on its head, um, it doesn't just stop with his birth story. It keeps going on and on in his life too. Uh, Jesus would say radical things that made people go, that doesn't seem right, or that can't be right. He would say things like, don't curse your enemy, but love your enemy and pray for him. He'd say that in the midst of worry, don't focus on your worry, but focus on prayer. Uh, he said radical things too, like, like, hey, maybe you shouldn't just be friends with the powerful, but you should make a friend with the poor. 
See, Jesus, he flipped the idea of greatness, the world's idea of greatness, upside down. And he invites you and me to live in this upside down kind of reality. But there's another way that Jesus lived an upside down kind of life. He was an upside down kind of king. It's this. He empathizes with us. See, Jesus, he he didn't just stay high off in a palace and distant. He, He lived how we lived. He felt what we feel. He's a king that was here on this earth, walking fully God in the flesh, but fully human as well. He empathizes with us. And there's a big difference, by the way, between sympathy and empathy. And Dr. Brene Brown, who's one of my favorite people to read and listen to, she describes this really well. She she describes empathy as feeling with other people. Feeling with. And she has this cool analogy, this cool visual to help you understand the difference between sympathy and empathy. See, sympathy, imagine you're walking down the street and you see a giant hole as you're walking by. And it's a 20-foot hole and you see somebody trapped down in the hole, yelling up for help. Sympathy is this. Sympathy is walking by, looking down at the hole and saying, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm really sorry. That that has to be tough. And then walking by and going to Chipotle. But, 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 no, I'm kidding. But, but empathy is this. You ready? Here's the difference. Empathy is looking at the person, grabbing a ladder, climbing down in the hole with them, to see what they see and feel what they feel. That's empathy. Brene Brown talks about how empathy is actually the great connector for relationships and how sympathy disconnects. See, there's power in empathy. And some of you, you know, I've been around Grace Church for a while, and some of you know my story. Um, and you know that a big part of my story is, is, fam- is, is mistakes made by family members that thanks to God's grace and our cooperation, um, he was able to redeem to make our family more united and stronger than ever. And, and it's by God's grace alone that that happened. But one of the best parts of my story, that the results of it, is that I just get to help people by having it. A few years ago, there was a student that texted me in the morning and said, hey, I, I need to come by after school. I, I need to talk to you. And when he got to my office a few hours later, um, he sat down and he described to me um, this, this, this mistake that a family member had made that was more in the public eye. And so his friends were starting to question him about it, and he was starting to get, you know, felt like the walls were closing in. And, and, and he sat on my couch and he was just crying and, and, and in a mix of, of sadness and anger and disappointment and frustration. He's like, I feel all these things, but here's the deal. I texted you, I came to you because I knew you'd understand. I knew you would get it. I knew you felt it. In that moment, I didn't have a theological truth to give him. I didn't do anything heroic. All I had was my pain. And I said, I understand. I know what that's like. My heart breaks for you. I'm so sorry, I feel for you. Let's let's journey together. See, friends, there's power in empathy. And just like there's power in empathy to connect you and me, Jesus, our King, empathizes with you and me. Here's how the author of Hebrews puts it. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, Jesus, who was fully God and fully human, he felt what we felt. He felt the pain of betrayal. He felt the grief of losing a loved one. He felt the joy of celebration. He felt love from his Father. He was tempted in every way, but he did not sin. And because of that, we can approach his throne with confidence. Not the throne of Caesar, not the throne of a political figure, not the throne of an ideology, not the throne of any influencer. We can approach the throne of Jesus who was tempted yet did not sin. That's the kind of renovator I want in my life. That's the kind of king I want to serve. What about you? 
See, he empathizes with us. And this church word for this ongoing work that we're talking about, this ongoing work of inner renovation done by God, this, this, word, this word is called sanctification. And we believe that when we say yes to a relationship with Jesus, that it's not just we're done then and that's it and we wait till we go to heaven. We believe that we enter in on this journey of growing closer to Jesus and becoming more like him. And it takes some cooperation from us. It takes us to, 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 to open the door, to crack the, leave the door open, if you will, crack the door a little bit and let God in to work in these areas of our lives. And sanctification, it's, that's the inter, in, internal renovation that happens in us. So I have a question I just want you to think about. What is it in you that needs renewed or restored? What's an area of your life right now that needs renewed or restored? Maybe it's an unhealthy tendency that you've realized to sort of maybe bubbled up over this past year, maybe bubbled up during quarantine, and you realize you have this unhealthy tendency that you just, you need to figure out how to, how to move off of it. Maybe it's this addiction or affliction or struggle that, that you've just been struggling with for so long, and you just gotta, like, like you, you gotta figure it out. Maybe there's a wall that you've been building up in your life for years now, and maybe that wall, it's time for that wall to just come down. Whatever that is, whatever that area is that needs renewal and res- restoration, I want to invite you to, to say yes to letting God in and do that internal renovation in your life. Think of it kind of like gutting a house. So you know when you gut a house, you, 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 tear, you tear everything down, you make it like to the skeleton of the house basically, just the bones. And you do that so you can build it back up and make it better. And, and it looks messy and it's hard work. And it can sometimes, you sometimes wonder, is this really worth it? But in the end, it is. And in the end, what what we find is something way more beautiful than what was previously there. Something that's restored and renewed. So I want to just give you a a few next steps. A few next steps of, of what do I do next? There's this area of my life that I need renewal, that I need restoration in, and I don't know what to do. Well, let me give you a couple pointers. The first thing I want to invite you to do is maybe there's been a question that you've had or a doubt that you've had that you've just been hanging on to and you've never voiced to anybody before. Maybe only you and God know it. You and your God in your prayer journal know it. I want to invite you, maybe it's time to ask that question. Find someone you trust and ask that question. Just a quick plug, in January, when we're back here in person, we're going to be doing this six-week series looking at some of the tough questions that Christ followers and, and, and those who are just maybe are even a little outside the you know, outside assurance on faith. They're not really 100% there. Um, some of the biggest questions that we have. And we're going to journey through this together and we'd love for you to be there. And maybe that's the time to voice your question. Or maybe, maybe for you, it's, it's, it's taking advantage of our Dive Deep um, Bible reading tool and starting with reading one word and journaling on that. Uh, maybe for you, it's, it's getting involved in mission work like you just heard Shelly share. And getting involved in, in, in letting God transform you while you help others discover who he is. Or maybe, maybe for you it's getting involved in community. Maybe you don't have people in your life right now that are cheerleaders, that are encouraging you to stay on this journey of sanctification. Whatever it is for you, I hope that you will take that next step. I want to share with you real quick a story about how I saw this at work in my own life this week. On Monday night, um, Taylor Foley and myself, we had the privilege of meeting with a group of college-age students um, just for dinner and some conversation. And and we felt like we needed to do this because all of us have been affected in different ways by this pandemic, but we really felt like our college students were one of the great most, you know, groups greatly affected by losing things this past senior year or losing things this current school year and trying to move to a new town and in the middle of a pandemic and meeting people. Like, it was just so tough. And so what, what was supposed to be an hour of just dinner and conversation, it ended up being about two and a half hours, and here's why. In the terms of what Taylor Floyd described it as to me on, on Tuesday morning, heaven came down in the youth room. And what happened is we went around the circle and students began sharing about their struggle with mental health, their struggle with loneliness, their struggle with isolation, their struggle with finances, their struggle with loss, their struggle with the unknown, their struggle with doubts, And one by one, everyone began to share about their current struggles. But then, it didn't end there. By the end of the night, what everyone was in agreement on is that they needed community. They needed other people cheering each other on to stay the course of looking to the ultimate renovator of Jesus for their life. They knew that they couldn't do this alone. They can't do this alone. And they said, we need God and we need each other. So that's what it looks like for 
a group of college students at Grace Church. But what does it look like for you? I'm going to ask this question one more time. Who can renovate my life? Is it Caesar and all the things that earth has to offer? Or is it Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings? And our prayer this Christmas is that you would welcome Jesus in to be the ultimate renovator of your life. Let's stand for prayer. Who can renovate my life? God, some of us, we've been, we've been crying that out. God, this year, we've been looking in a lot of different places for a lot of different things, and God, we need a renovator. God, for some of us, we realize that there's an area of our life that we haven't given to you, fully surrendered to you. God, for some of us, we, we, we just feel we don't even know where to start. And God, I pray that right now, for those that need to know that they are seen and loved by you, that they would be assured of that right here in this moment. God, those of you that need, to know, that need assurance that you feel what they feel, that you feel their brokenness, you feel their pain, you feel their sorrow, you feel their joy, you feel their love, God, that they would be assured of that right now. God, we pray that as we think about these areas of our life that, that, that need renewal, that need restoration, God, that we would look to you to be our ultimate renovator. God, that we would leave the door open and let you in and welcome you in to do the the hard but necessary work. God, we thank you that you don't give up on us. We thank you that you see us right where we are and that you love us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.